The current pandemic has had a significant impact on women. Women have already worked a double shift even before the pandemic and are now taking on double, double shifts. Our economy relies on women, upheld by our paid and unpaid labor. This year shone a harsh light on this inequality as the strain on our mothers, our daughters, our sisters became more visible and more urgent. We lost our jobs, our childcare, our sense of normalcy. And this isn't the first time women have faced great challenges. But strength can come from togetherness. Now is our chance to make our efforts inclusive of all women. Because every woman has the right to thrive, to keep loved ones safe, to protect their health, to access vital resources, to pursue dreams and find joy. Now is the time to ensure we don't fall back decades and is our chance to make progress for future generations. Now more than ever, we must bring every woman with us, amplify each other's voices, power our mothers, our daughters, our sisters. Now, we must power her. I want to welcome everyone to Women in the Move, and I want you to know we truly appreciate your participating. I much prefer to be doing this in person, but this will have to suffice uh, this year. As you know, we all support advancing women in America and around the world, their careers as, uh, as businesswomen, helping them. We know that COVID has made it a lot harder for, for working women. And uh, so we'll be talking about a lot at this at the conference. But uh, J.P. Morgan is devoted to doing what we can to make this an equitable society for everybody involved, uh, whether you're black or a woman or LGBT, Hispanic, Latinx, we're, we're there for you. And so uh, we hope you enjoy the conference. We always learn a lot from this, too. And I want to thank a lot of you for participating again. And Sam, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome to Women on the Move Leadership Day. The mission of our event has always been to inspire women and empower them to lift each other up. This year, we need that support more than ever. The pandemic has changed our world forever, but I believe there are some silver linings. In the future, our new normal can be a better one for all of us. This crisis has exposed long-standing issues facing women. The enormous amount of unpaid and invisible work that women do has been on full display. When everyone stayed home and all those responsibilities became visible, the burden on women became even more clear. We now see momentum around improving childcare and a growing acknowledgement that this is critical, not just for working parents, but for the broader economy. We also see local communities and businesses coming together and women are finding solutions. One of our clients, Dr. Sonnet Biernicker Hart, literally changed the entire operations of her company, Koval Distillery. She went from making alcohol to producing hand sanitizer, which she then donated to frontline workers in Chicago. The crisis has also removed perceived barriers for how we work. We know that remote work is both possible and productive. It's time to break the stigma of working from home and get more companies to offer it. This flexibility is important to women and a growing number of men and should be a viable option in our modern workplace. With this backdrop, I believe we're poised for positive change. There are clear indications that people are looking to create a new normal that is fair and inclusive. It's a new normal that recognizes the interconnectivity of people and the impact we have on each other's lives. A new normal where women have work flexibility, accessible and affordable childcare, and more support at home. And a new normal where women of all ethnicities and backgrounds are free to pursue their dreams without bias, limitations, or fear. I believe we can do better than just rebuild the world of the past. This is our opportunity to build a brighter future for all. Women on the Move and J.P. Morgan Chase are here to drive that change. I hope today's event inspires you, helps you navigate the challenges you face, and provides some direction toward creating a new normal that we can all embrace.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women on the Move Leadership Day 2020. I am so thrilled to be here with you. I am Ali Love. I will be your host throughout this event. And now let's go ahead, since we're spending quite a bit of time and get to know each other. I am a Peloton instructor. I'm the host of the Brooklynettes, and I'm the CEO and founder of Love Squad. And now as we embark on a journey of leaning into information and connecting with one another, what I'd like us to do is to set some framework. I want to bring up something you have heard before, self-care. Now, self-care usually is brought to us and it's one-sided, only talks about our physical self. And so as I lay the structure throughout this event, I wanna talk about self-care completely. The three M's, your matter, your mind, your meaning. Matter, mind, and meaning, our three M's are gonna set the stage as we really get into this conversation. Also, keep in mind, we'd love to have this conversation on social, take to social, use the hashtag PowerHer. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this show on the road I'm really, really looking forward to this. So let's spend some quality time together. Deep inhale, deep exhale, feel your physical self, take in your physical space, make eye contact. Hey, I see you. All right, let's have a great event. Here's part one. Hi, my name is Lori Santos. I'm a professor of psychology at Yale University. And today we're gonna to talk about how you can start with your well-being. Why start with your well-being? We often think that career success involves focusing on our resume virtues, you know, building up some skill set, making our resumes look more polished. But the data really suggests that if we want to boost our job success, we need to focus on well-being first. Sometimes we think of this as selfish or that happiness is this kind of ephemeral thing. But the research really suggests that focusing on our well-being can be a quick path to improving our creativity, our job performance, and even our job satisfaction. And for that, I'm going to give you my top three tips that come from the science of well-being on how you can invest in your own happiness and invest in your own happiness in a way that I think will increase your career success in ways that you don't often expect. Okay, so what are these top three tips? First tip, I think, is the most important, and that is that if you want to be happier, if you really want to invest in your well-being, you also have to invest in your social connections. Every available study uh, in, in the field of positive psychology, frankly, suggests that social connection is the path to happiness. If you look at happy people, happy people tend to be more social. They tend to report spending lots of time with their friends and family members. And they tend to also report prioritizing their social connection. In other words, they see it as something that they need to invest in just as much as they're investing in their career success. And I think it's worth bringing this up, particularly right now. You know, we're having this conversation right now in the midst of COVID-19. And what the data really suggests is that this might be one of the reasons this time in 2020 has been so stressful for everyone, because we're actually reducing all our really simple social connections in ways we often don't even realize. You know, all of us hopefully are practicing our social distancing. That's what's going to cause us to stay healthy during this pandemic. But social distancing can sometimes mean slight reductions in social connection. So I think it's all the more important that we see this as an area that we really need to invest in right now. How do we do that? Well, we really need to prioritize time and like rich, nutritious time connecting with the people we care about. You know, things are busy, but can you bring in, you know, a date night with your partner? Can you bring in some real quality time with your family members? Can you pick up the phone and call that college friend you haven't talked to in a while? These things sound really simple, but the data suggests that actually investing them, you know, literally putting those things in your calendar too, can be a big boost for your well-being. What's tip number two? Another one that we don't expect and one that can be kind of hard in the modern environment. And it's that if we want to be like happy people, we need to invest in gratitude. You know, it's the moment taking minutes of our day to count our blessings, right? Now, if you're like me, this is something that doesn't come naturally. You know, I'm not a kind of count my blessings gal. I'm more of a sort of, you know, count all the bad stuff, count the hassles sort of gal. You know, I'm sort of a complainer and a griper, but that's what makes me different than most other happy people. Happy people spontaneously look to the bright side of life. Happy people spontaneously recognize the things that they're grateful for. And the data really suggests that, again, if this isn't something that comes naturally, it's something you can pretty easily intervene on. 
The data suggests that the simple act of scribbling down three to five things that you're grateful for every night can significantly improve your well-being in as little as two weeks, which is really quite striking. You know, something that's completely free, you don't have to buy anything, maybe just a pencil to scribble things down, and you can have a significant boost to your well-being. So that's tip number two. If we want to be like happy people, we need to take time for gratitude and really invest in it. Tip number three gets us to the final tip that I think is most important, which is that if we want to be like happy people and really invest our, in our happiness, we need to invest in being present. We need to invest in being mindful. Now, this is something also that seems a little bit foreign. Um, some of us sort of aren't feeling mindful and in the present moment, you know, sort of really paying attention to what's in the here and now. A lot of us experience what researchers call mind wandering, where our mind is here and there, you know, thinking about lunch, thinking about that project that's coming up. And it can make us feel a little frazzled. And so the data really suggests that if we want to be happier, we need to focus on reducing our mind wandering. How do we do that? through a practice that's getting lots and lots of attention these days, which is the simple practice of meditation. The simple act of taking five minutes to focus on your breath, and every time your mind wanders away, yank it back. And so that's tip number three. If you wanna be like happy people, you need to sort of pre prevent that mind wandering and stay in the present moment. Even if the present moment is feeling quite yucky, what are you gonna to do today to improve your social connection, boost your gratitude, and pay a little bit more attention to the present moment? If you can answer that question, You'll not only have three specific strategies that you can use to feel a little bit better today, but there'll be strategies that will down the line improve your career success too. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome. I'm Janet Alvarez, bilingual personal finance and credit expert for the Motley Fool's Ascent brand and a financial news anchor covering the pandemic's economic toll. Through my work, I've seen firsthand the fear and the anxiety consumers are facing. And the top two questions I hear the most are, first, how can female workers and small entrepreneurs protect their finances? And second, how do we build a stronger post-COVID future, including educating our daughters and sons about money? With these questions in mind, I want to share a few tips for setting yourself up for the long-term success that you need. I've created a checklist to empower you to take control of your finances and to ease that anxiety today. First, it's important to take stock of where you are financially. How much money is coming in every month and how much are you spending? If you can't answer these questions, then it's time to examine your financial picture and create a budget. Knowing your current position is the only way to know what your next step should be. And as you make your budget, consider what has changed in the last few months. Are you dining out less and eating more at home? Spending less on travel and apparel? What good habits can stick with you after we return to normalcy? Then think about other ways you can cut down on spending. Consider canceling or pressing pause on automatic contributions you aren't using, for example, commuter expenses if you're working remotely or not working during the pandemic. Next, review all of the subscription services you're currently paying for, things like streaming services and content providers, and evaluate if there are opportunities to consolidate or even to scale back. And once you assess your spending patterns, it's time to focus on your current savings and investing plan. On savings, if you have less than three to six months of savings in your emergency savings account, put money there first before paying extra toward debt. Emergency needs will always arise, things like medical bills and car repairs, and you want to be prepared. Remember that even a small amount of money, as little as a dollar a day, adds up over time. Spending just a dollar less every day would add up to over $1,800 over five years and $3,600 over 10 years. Consider tools such as Chase Autosave to set it and forget it so saving becomes an ingrained behavior. On investing, if you're still earning income and can pay your necessary bills, continue contributing at least the minimum to your 401k in order to get your employer match. Continuing to invest is important, both in your retirement account as well as other investments, because you do not want to miss out on the gains when the economy does recover. Stay the course. Keep investing, even when the markets look shaky, because that's often when stocks are cheapest. Know that wealth is built by investing over time, and that while it's all right to be concerned when markets drop, you shouldn't base investment decisions on fear. Research shows that people who continued investing during the last downturn recovered and got back on track. If you're currently unable to pay all your bills and need to pause your retirement contributions, it's still best to leave the account untouched. If you withdraw from your 401k, be mindful that you might incur penalties. 
a great way to assess your financial health is by keeping an eye on your money, especially by monitoring your credit score and credit report. Among the biggest risks to the health of your credit score is a missed payment or a bill sent to collections. So reach out to your lenders or landlord prior to missing a payment to see what you can work out and be on the lookout for fraud. During the pandemic, criminals are increasingly trying to take advantage of people online. The Fair Credit Reporting Act gives you the right to one free credit report from each of the three credit reporting agencies, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian every 12 months. Review these and ensure there's nothing erroneous. And if there is, get it fixed as soon as possible. To minimize the chance of fraud, don't give out your personal details or account numbers to anyone who calls or emails you and ensure all of your passwords to financial websites are robust and well protected. Think about getting an auto-generated password creator to ensure passwords cannot be cracked. Having your kids at home can be extremely challenging as you try to get work done, but it can also be a great gift. It can be a wonderful opportunity to teach our daughters and our sons some simple but very important money lessons. While you're working on your household budget, ask your teenagers to craft their own budget alongside you. Even younger kids can benefit. Instead of giving your school-aged child a $10 bill for allowance, give them 10 $1 bills. Then teach them the envelope method. They should put six or seven dollars into an envelope for spending, two or three dollars in an envelope for savings, and at least a dollar in an envelope for helping others. And don't forget to lift up other women around you. This crisis calls on us to shop at small women-owned businesses when we can, instead of big box stores. And this crisis calls on us to gather our female friends on a Zoom call, not only for book club and wine night, but also for talking about budgeting, talking about investing, and helping each other get a little smarter financially. This crisis asks us to find a way forward that includes us all. Reach out to the women in your network to share tips that have helped you sustain the finances. Thank you. It's been such an honor to share my thoughts with you today. I know we all see the roads were brighter tomorrow and that we'll walk that path together. Wow, what an incredible way to kick off the event. I wanted to highlight one of the things that kind of stuck with me was from Professor Lori Santos. She mentioned investing in social connections, investing in gratitude, and investing in being mindful and staying present. I wanted to highlight that because again, as we consume a lot of this thoroughly thoughtful information that we are being present, we are being mindful. That brings us to the first M. Remember I talked about three M's in the very beginning, so we're gonna get into that right now. Your first M is matter. It's all about your physical well-being. And so as you, again, are into your space, take a deep inhale, deeper exhale, feel your physical body. Sometimes we don't realize when we are uh, physically unwell. And so some identifiers of that, as we talk about being an investor of gratitude or social connections, is this concept of, am I physically feeling good? Identifiers that maybe you don't feel so good physically, a quick loss of breath, being less active than you like. We all know that work gets in the way. I am too a culprit of that. Another identifier, you know, you have that call from your doctor. Some of us have been there too. But in terms of regrouping, again, coming back to that investment of social connection, that investment of mindfulness and staying present, the first M of matter and your physical well being is making sure that we protect the health of our physical well being. Some of the things that I suggest and that comes up for me as we get ready to go into our next segment is making sure that you lean into things that are fun. So we're having a great time today, but a lot of us, you know, as I talked about being a Peloton instructor, a lot of us work out. Make sure we find a workout that's fun, that we're doing physical activity. You gotta get up and stretch your legs or walk around, that it's fun, that you enjoy it. Another thing that comes up is to make sure that's sustainable. Anything that we do in life, we wanna make sure that it's sustainable. Eliminate any obstacles in getting it done, taking care of our physical well-being. And last but definitely not least, and not the end all be all, make sure we create a schedule. We have a great run of show ahead of us. We've created a schedule on the flow of content, but that goes back, all of these structural things go back to how we can protect and how we can keep the well being of ourselves safe and, of course, healthy. So as we get into part two, again, come back to that breathing, come back to the physical awareness, come back to that first M of matter as we connect, as we invest as we stay present, make sure that we are surrounding ourselves and positioning ourselves physically because our matter matters. So with that, let's go ahead and get into part two, some more wisdom by some phenomenal women.
Hello and welcome. I'm Robin Leopold, Head of Human Resources, and I am absolutely delighted to be here interviewing today Melody Hobson. Many of you know Melody as a board member of J.P. Morgan Chase. She is co-CEO of Ariel Investments and also a board member of Starbucks. Melody, it is such a treat for me to interview you, and I know our listeners today are going to learn a lot from you and take lots of nuggets from our conversation. So I'm going to get right into it. And it's a, it is a big question. Let me start with, as a little girl growing up in Chicago, what were your dreams? Wow, that's a big question. And thank you so much, Robin, for having me. I'm delighted to do this. Um, my dreams as a child were very simple. I wanted to be financially secure. And I wanted that from when I was very, very young. Maybe I can remember it all the way back to four or five years old. I grew up the youngest of six kids, and my mom was a single mom. And we had a, some really challenging experiences when I was growing up. Now that's not different than a lot of people in our country. And in many ways, my story is the story of the American dream. But those early days really left a deep, deep impression on me because we would get evicted or our car would get repossessed or our lights would get turned off. We sometimes lived in an abandoned building. And all of that really just made me yearn for security, particularly financial security, which is why I don't think it's an accident that I'm in the investment business. You went to Princeton, so you absolutely lived the dream. And you've been at Ariel Investments the entire time. What has made you stay for since leaving Princeton this entire time? So they say the average American has 11 jobs in their lifetime. I've only ever had one. Most people have them earlier in their career. At Princeton, supposedly, I'm the only person from my graduating class of 1,100 people who's had the same work phone number since I graduated from, from college. The reason I've stayed at my firm is I've been so fulfilled by the work and I've been challenged by the people. And those that's a winning combination. I've, had the opportunity to work alongside the founder of Ariel, who's now my co-CEO, John Rogers. And John, from the very beginning, just poured his heart and soul into helping me be a better leader and a better teammate, and uh, really just really invested a lot in me. And as our relationship evolved over those years to mentor, mentee, and then um, you know I slowly became a peer, and then now we are co-CEOs, I just found, you know, an ethical person who really had my best interest at heart. And we shared a common mission in terms of what we wanted for our company and what we wanted for the individuals that work with us, as well as what we wanted certainly for our customers. And that is just a joy. And I knew that that doesn't happen every day. So that's one thing that kept me. The other thing that kept me was the work. I love the work. I love the challenge of the day to day. I love getting clients. I love explaining to them what we do. I love watching the markets. I love learning about great leaders and great companies. And all of that really has fulfilled me. And then last but not least, but probably equally important, is the idea that we do something that makes people's lives better. You know, capitalists get a bad rap in our society, and I think that's totally misinformed because at the end of the day, people can retire comfortably, send their kids to college, start the business that they want to start, hopefully have not just golden years but platinum years when they retire. All of that I think about every day that we're doing something to make people's lives better. And that, for me, drives me to want to work harder and do better. Well, speaking of working hard, I, I did hear that you have stated in, in other forums that nobody can outwork you. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, you try to think about what are your competitive advantages in life. And I think that's very important to try to identify. And for me, you know, there are going to be people who are smarter, richer, better. There are all those things. But I said, you can't outwork me. Like, I can actually make that a competitive advantage. I can have the resilience and the stamina to outwork someone, and I do. And so hard work is not just not, um, I'm not afraid of it, I embrace it. Let me shift topics. Uh, obviously, this year in particular, the topic of systemic racism has been front and center. And at JP Morgan, we have had lots of conversations about race and our desire to have a more inclusive workforce. What's your advice to companies as they think about advancing women, specifically black women, is there any 
any advice that you would give corporations to think about and build into their 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 plans? Yes. There are a few things that I would think about. So we do this conference called the Black Corporate Directors Conference, and we've been doing it for two decades. And we talk about the three Ps, people, purchasing, and philanthropy. And when we think about anything in business, I have the saying, math has no opinion. And in business, we know if it matters, it counts. And so I tell people, count, it's that simple. And so counting mean look, look at, means look at your organization from the very top all the way through, and then look at your organization by ethnicity, African-American, Latinx, Asian, et cetera. Don't put us all under some multicultural umbrella that masks the uh, inequality that might exist in the numbers. So start with knowing where do you stand and how do those numbers look versus the overall population, our demographics in this society, then you can see where your shortfalls are. I think it's very important people talk about having diverse slates when they interview people. All the data shows you want more than one person who's diverse. The other thing is to really force yourself, and I mean this when I say it, to be thoughtful about inclusion. When I started working at Ariel, the first day, John Rogers told me, Melody, I was 22 years old, you're gonna be in rooms with people who have big titles and make a lot of money. It doesn't mean they have better ideas. He was listening to me. He said, I want your ideas. Inclusion means you hear someone that they live in an environment where they can speak their truth. Now we as black women also have a role and we have to make sure we're leaning into the opportunity that we're speaking up, that we're making sure that we put our opinions out there, that we're taking risks. I know that's in us. Um, but you have to be in an environment that also invites that and wants that. We are spending so much time right now around not just the diversity representation numbers, as you're saying, but inclusion. But, you know, the social inequalities, that conversation, the geopolitical tensions that are going on. You touched a little bit on resiliency, but how have you had to shift and just how are you, what are you doing to, to really stay resilient during this very difficult time? My, I have a continual um, sense of gratitude and also responsibility to others who I think are really suffering right now. I feel that at the same time, simultaneously. I was sulking a little bit in the early days of the pandemic about feeling, you know, trapped, for lack of a better word. Um, we're all in cages. Mine is more gilded. I, I totally understand that and appreciate that. Um, but it's still a cage. And my husband looked at me and he said, you know, Melody, during World War II, people lived in bunkers for five years, years. He said they were rationed food. They were reading scraps that they could get of news by candlelight or flashlight, get some perspective. I thought that was a, a, a powerful point and powerful moment because it anchored me in history and it anchored me in the suffering and the pain that many have experienced over generations that had, and where we saw tremendous um, things come out of it. Here's another silver lining out of the pandemic. We're seeing people that we didn't see before. And that, you know, the frontline workers are, are incredibly, incredibly important. And I'm so grateful. That's a gift that our society is getting. Humanity is better for it. I agree. I totally agree. So let me, let me get, ask you to just speak to the audience around just a nugget or two in terms of career advice at this point in time. What should they be thinking about? Well, certainly the pandemic, I think, has led to a lot of soul searching. And we're seeing a lot of people at all stages of life um, reevaluate what they're doing and how they're doing it. And if you aren't doing that, I, I think that that makes total and complete sense. The one thing I would say that I think is very important, I wouldn't make any rash decisions. I see people having knee -jer jerk decisions in this environment. This is a moment in time before I did anything major, if I was gonna make a change, I would wait till we're out of this warm moment and see if I, see if I still felt that way. Oh, it is excellent advice. And honestly, Melody, what a great way to end. On behalf of everybody listening, I just wanted to say thank you very much for taking your time. I know how, how you feel about J.P. Morgan Chase and our colleagues are really fortunate to hear from you today. Thank you for, for joining. Thanks for having me and thanks for all the work that you do for the company. You're a rock star too. Hi, 
everyone. I'm Marianne Lake. I'm the CEO of Consumer Lending at JP Morgan Chase and one of the co-founders and executive sponsors of Women on the Move. And so I am absolutely thrilled today uh, to be here to discuss uh, with you um, the background and uh, leadership skills and experiences of our newest board member here at JP Morgan Chase and the executive chairman of IBM, Ginny Romerty. So uh, Ginny, thank you so much for joining us today for um, what I know is going to be a really interesting discussion. Oh, my pleasure to do it. Thank you, Marianne. For, thank you for asking me. <laughs> of course. So um, I know that we're going to spend uh, probably a lot of time talking through the sort of leadership um, lessons and skills and challenges, you know, in your role as the CEO of IBM. But I thought maybe we would start with just a bit of context about, you know, how you got uh, to that uh, esteemed position and, and maybe get a bit from you about your background and what some of the challenges and hurdles were as you were sort of progressing through that journey so that the audience and, and everybody gets a bit of a sense of who you are and you know what that background uh, that brought you here looks like. Mm, okay, well, you know, it's a funny thing. Someone recently asked me to pick one word to describe 2020 and uh, in answering this question, I'm thinking of that one word because the one word I picked was perspective because I feel amongst this year, it's been some time to sit back and reflect. And so a question that, that, that makes me think again about what brought me to this moment and what did I learn, it has changed with time. And you said the word hurdles and what time does give you by the way is perspective. And uh, to me now, all those hurdles, they really were just opportunities to grow. And I'm not sure they ever felt like hurdles to me, but um, I began over time to see them as each time I hit a bump, it was a chance to really grow and become something else. And so I began to get quite comfortable with those kinds of things. And so when I think back in time, um, maybe a few sort of short stories of my life. Uh, when I was a teenager, um, one day my father just up and left my mother. And I was one of four children in the family. And my mother had not gone to college, had never worked a day in her life. And I think there's probably many people out there who can identify with this right now. But she found herself with four kids. Four kids, no money, no home, no food stamps as a result of all of this. And the happy ending to that story when you say perspective of your life, I mean, it did really teach me. My mom said, well, this isn't gonna be the ending of this story. She went back to school, she got a degree, she got a job, we all, did fine. I always say I'm the underachiever between my brothers and sisters. we have done fantastic. And, but it did teach me, and this does then shape me for the rest of my life, this point about no one will ever define who you are but yourself. And so that I think has stayed with me forever, that you determine what the outcome is going to be. You define who you are. So that was kind of my early life. Um, I then, I have an engineering degree. And so that really then positioned me, my early, uh, first job was working for General Motors, but making cars wasn't my passion. So I learned if you want a career, you should do something you're passionate about. And that took me then to IBM. But I kind of end my answer where I began with you, Mary And I think every hurdle I crossed then, I really got comfortable with a saying that many people heard me say that growth and comfort, they never coexist. And so if you're going to grow, you will always be uncomfortable. And in fact, if you find yourself too comfortable, go do something new because then you know you're learning and growing at the same time. I think perspective is a great word when you think not just about how you um, have made your journey, but also um, I agree with you, 2020 has been um, a really challenging year in many, many ways. And so, you know, this is a um, moment in time when there has been an unprecedented use of the word unprecedented. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're obviously facing a very significant health crisis, a um, significant economic um, period of uncertainty, um, high levels of unemployment, um, social unrest, civil unrest, all coming together in a sort of collision in 2020. And so as you um, think about, you know, where you're sitting in the uh, position you're in now as the exec executive chairman of IBM, and think about what leading through a crisis like this means. Um, just give us some insights as to how you, um, you yourself and your board and your company have thought about leading through this situation. Yeah. So having 
you know, IBM is itself having lived through, whether it was wars, whether it was 9-11, market crashes. I mean, you lived through a number of these, even in your um, in your lesser time than I've had, but you know, at this, but having been through it all, um, whenever they, I've always found I get the calmest in the most turmoil. And to me, this is about just staying really focused on what your purpose is in that I do believe purpose matters for most companies right now and the more clear you are about it, the more attractive you are to both employees, to customers, et cetera. So, you know, when I think of COVID and there are many things people, when it sort of started to sink in what was happening here, right? We took ourselves 400,000 people, 95% were remote in about two days. Now, the others had to be out there because they're out there in all of your companies doing things. So first was get that done, but then boy, uh, immediately the team worked on putting together a high performance consortium to go um, latch all the high performance computers in the world to help work on the cure for COVID. And it's true for COVID and it's true now with the focus on uh, racial justice here has been employment because I feel I could see this immediately what was going to happen. And I still believe there's issues ahead of us now on this topic. And I saw a report yesterday, 26% young black women unemployed. Um, this is to me back to what do you do in these moments? You lead from your core purpose. And it, it, these are things that are both good for business, good for the community, the stakeholder, and it is a focus on economic opportunity will solve many, many of these things. And so when you said, what do you do in these moments? Um, a, your initial reactions are on your purpose. Your second reaction then, by the way, is to reimagine. I mean, the opportunity, you see, you look at everything as a glass half full. Okay, almost everything's thrown in the air. You get a chance how to, to reimagine your company and other things that you do. But then the third is, I think, this obligation that business has through public-private partnership to solve these big issues. So um, just to, to build on that sort of theme of how you make progress, like real tangible um, step change in progress on diversity and inclusion, because diversity has been something that people have talked about for a very long time. Are there any other um, ways in which, you know, IBM or you as a leader have been able to actually, you know, it's a long game, make change that you think is sustainable in diversity and also in inclusion? So maybe, maybe a tip for those that, you know, as, as people watch, I do believe we each decide, like I think it's part of our job to be a responsible steward. So when I got hired into IBM, my first four managers were women. First four, as I kept being, were all women. Just isn't that interesting? The first woman, and again, our precursor companies was 1899, right? I mean, we had equal opportunity as a firm rule, but that conviction to stay with every small activity that supports it, right? Because as you said, diversity is a number, inclusion is a choice that people make. Mm -hmm. And so you have to reinforce it in everything you do. So you can't fight everything, by the way, but you pick the ones that you think are really important. And so those are public things you do and then things within your own company you do. So that when you say, what else have we done or the impact? I think it's been this consistency of action. It's been standing up for the understood that are out there and being a role model for being an inclusive uh, company, but with a role model for public-private partnership. So I think that, you know, as I listen to that, one of the things that, you know, I take away from that, um, which again, you know, does resonate employees, they look to the leadership in the company, um, we use the words trust, we use the words trust and confidence, that, that they have the trust and confidence that we kind of have their backs on these issues. And I think, you know, not that you can fight every fight, but I think that's very important. And then running diversity and inclusion and, you know, people, workforce, culture, all of that, running it like it is an absolutely equal, if not, you know, first priority business uh, priority with a long term focus. So I think if everyone approached um, this, you know, endeavor with a long term focus, with consistency of execution, with an objective to, you know, engender the trust and confidence of the people who work for us, then, you know, we would make the same progress that we make in our business strategies. So I'm uh, grateful for that because you, you know, you're humble about it, but you broke ground. And so thank you for being a part of that. Um, maybe on that note, uh, you could just 
um, you know, step back and, and talk maybe about some women, maybe, but perhaps not, um, in your life that have inspired you and in what ways they've left marks on you that you've, you know, taken away and embodied in your own, you know, personal and professional leadership? Yes. Well, um, you wouldn't be surprised if I told you my mother. Um, you wouldn't be surprised if I told you my grandmother, who had a lamp store, who made um, lampshades, and she's the one that taught me to sew. But, when, but what my grandmother taught me, it was, again, you take care of yourself. Always be in a position you can take care of yourself. Never have to rely on someone else. But some of the, when I was thinking about coming and talking to you today, I was thinking about that, about other women who I, I think are heroes. And I think you have one of my heroes on your agenda, which is uh, Condi Rice. And I would put in the same category another woman, Dr. Shirley Jackson. And what I think is so special about both of them, I think of them as a force of nature, but they lead with dignity and grace. And it is just a, just awe-inspiring, you know, for me to watch and learn from women who were able to take their positions, be steadfast in what they do, yet be themselves at the same time, and uh, and have a huge impacts on the world and be the first in so many things. And so that forces nature, but with grace and dignity. So um, be yourself, be authentic, um, all great pieces of advice, so many inspiring women. I'm glad you started actually with your mother and with your grandmother because, I mean, it's kind of where we all start. And it's really interesting when you watch people and we've had the opportunity to watch people, you know, over an extended period of time during 2020 and how people respond and you know, really great leaders are people who are calm and, you know, working through the issues and, you know, having the fortitude and the perspective and the perseverance. So um, it's been really great to hear you uh, thread all that together and lots and lots of it resonates with me. As I say, it's been really great to hear, you know, directly from you and so many things that I think people can take away that are leverageable no matter what um, stage of your career or your life you're in, no matter what industry you're in and, um, I would just like to thank you for taking the time and sharing those thoughts with um, with me and with the audience. Thank you, Jenny. My pleasure. Hi, my name is Phyllis Campbell. I'm the chairman of the Pacific Northwest for J.P. Morgan Chase, and I am so excited and privileged to be able to interview Rosalind Brewer, the chief operating officer of Starbucks. She's better known as Roz, so welcome, Roz. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm really glad to be here. So I'm just going to jump right in, if that's okay. And I think one of the things that uh, being here in Seattle with your company, Starbucks, we've admired how well Starbucks uh, has responded quickly during the crisis, keeping your customers and your employees safe. So could you talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges that you faced as the chief operating officer when the crisis hit? And how did you handle them? Sure. So, you know, the crisis hit us first in our China operations and they began to see cases in mid-December. So by third week of January, we were in a full on war room setting in the Seattle offices, just creating scenarios to say, what if this comes to the States? And lo and behold, uh, by early February, we began to hear uh, rumors of it. And then the uh, some locations right in Seattle became first hard hit. So we immediately went into crisis mode. And the first thing we did was set principles. And one of our most important principles was how to keep our baristas safe. So we went totally on a safety mode saying, what kind of PPE did they need? How do we secure it? And then began to address the stores and figure out how do we put in uh, safety measures in the stores for cleanliness, hygiene, separation of duties, um, plexiglass and drive through windows, and then eventually a fuller blown plan. I'm gonna shift again, uh, shift gears and into the racial uh, justice or injustice subject. And you've been such a leader through your career. I've followed um, many of the, I guess really what I would say, the um, principles that you've set in that arena with your um, advocacy for racial justice and diversity and inclusion. And I don't have to tell this audience really about uh, what we've been through as a nation in the last um, number of months since the horrific killing of George Floyd in May. 
But I, you know, I, I am interested in your um, thoughts, uh, not just about the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests, but specifically Starbucks. You know, if you think about your own company's journey, how has this impacted Starbucks? Um, you know, and, and I guess what are some observations that you have about, has it changed the culture? Has it shifted conversations? So I think everyone recognizes Starbucks as a brand that leads in this space around racial equity. Uh, fair treatment of others, and really being a pillar in the community for doing things that other companies likely wouldn't do and wouldn't address right away. But this has been a challenge because um, these there's been successive issues. Um, we are noticing that this is taking a toll on not only our African American, our black employees, but it is taking a toll on every one of our employees. And so this has now become a universal issue. And what we um, have tried to do was to create courageous conversations within our company to help our partners understand that we see them, we hear them, and we understand what's happening here, and we want to be a part of change. And so it takes us back to the work that we did when we had our own incident in Philadelphia where two African-American men were arrested. And then we knew that our principles and guidelines had to really address how do we um, further create a warm and welcoming environment when the environment outside our doors is changing. You mentioned the Philadelphia store, the two black men, for those of you that don't remember, that uh, were called, uh, the police were called uh, by the store manager because they suspected the motives of these two black men. But your personal story, you had just come to the company, and I, I remember thinking you stepped up right away to address this in a courageous way. But actually, was it your son that called you? I'd love to know a little bit more about that conversation. Yeah. How, how did that affect you? So crazy. Um, so it was really interesting. While this incident was going on, I happened to have left uh, Seattle for the weekend to go over to San Francisco. And I was meeting with two mentees that I had. They happened to be African-American males that are, they roughly both were between the ages of 25 and 30. And this situation was brewing. I saw it playing out on black social media and I knew um, I needed to get involved and address it, but uh, everything was happening all at once. I got a call from my son as he saw it hit social media and he said, mom, what's going on? And um, I told him what I knew and he said, you know, you can't let this happen. He's like, you've got to do something. This, this is not going to happen um, like this. And so he pushed me um, to take a real strong position on this and try and help the company understand uh, what we needed to do. Um, because, um, and me as a mom of a 25 year old, uh, same age as the two gentlemen sitting in our store in Philadelphia, um, I looked at those two individuals and they look just like my son. My son, um, you know, looks just like that on the weekend, you know, and, um, and they were just having a casual conversation. And so I knew from a very personal emotional standpoint that I had to intervene and help the company understand what's our best move next. And, and we did, we uh, got into uh, Philadelphia um, in less than 24 hours, not a lot of clothes. And we just kind of made it happen, created a war room there in Philadelphia. And we worked around the clock to uh, get that situation taken care of. Well, thank you for sharing that personal story. That really makes it, um, you know, very uh, tangible. And I want to just probably close this out by asking a couple personal questions because I think everybody looks at you and says, my gosh, there's, there's this incredible, which I, I do too, accomplished woman who's had no obstacles in her life. But, you know, there, there has to be moments when you think there were, uh, uh, there was a moment where you thought, is this happening to me, this unconscious bias or maybe bordering on racism? Is there an incident or something you could share that you would say, you know, I still overcome this even today or I had numerous obstacles, any advice there, or I guess personal yeah. vignettes? Wow, um, you know, to be honest with you, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that lately um, with all that's going on. Um, I think about how have I done it? Um, how can I teach? Uh, what more do I have to learn? Um, and then I think about the roadblocks I've run into. And many people think I haven't had roadblocks, but I have, and I've had some dark moments, to be honest with you. Um, I recall, um, one of my performance evaluations, I was an early on vice president um, at um, in a personal care company. And in that 
uh, performance eval, my uh, manager said to me, you know, you think you're smart, um, but um, you're really not as smart as you think you are. And, um, you know, I think we're, you know, we're going to need to leave you in this role for a little while longer and, you know, your development will be slower. Um, and this is while he's sitting there blowing cigarette smoke in my face, right? And it's just like the whole scene was like, this whole thing is ugly, right? I'm like, you know, the cigarette puffer in my face and telling me I'm not smart. And so I'm just sitting there looking at him and I'm just madder than the Dickens. And then after a while, I just started cracking up laughing. I'm just like, this is the funniest scene I've ever <laughs> thought of in my life, you know? But then I'm thinking now he thinks I'm dumb and crazy because I'm laughing in his face, you know? And I just had to, you know, shake it off because the day that someone gets to tell me that I'm not smart enough, I, you know, th that's just not gonna happen, you know? And I'm not gonna accept it. Um, because at that point, um, I knew what I knew, and I clearly knew what I didn't know. And I was just waiting for him to tell me, you know, my shortcomings that I, you know, I, I, I had honed in on. But, you know, it's those kinds of things that if I had listened to him, and he was a very strong, well-respected leader in the company, if I had listened to him, I would have cried in a bucket and said, you know, this is it for me. But he really charged. He gave me charge. And um, after that, um, I actually took over the unit that he was running after he retired. And so um, it, it maybe gave me a little bit more energy, but I've had a couple of those instances, um, unfortunately. And um, I, I look back on those and I'm grateful that I didn't listen. And I just say that to so many women that I mentor is that, you know, watch your inner voice and don't let it get confused with what you're hearing externally. That's great advice. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so really, I think the last question I have for you today is all of the women that we're featuring today, including you, are just incredible women and so accomplished. And I think the audience would like to know who, ins who has inspired you? Wow. Um I could, I can, if I could pick two, I would just love that, Phyllis, if you could uh, let me do that. Um, one um, is sure. my mother. Um, my mother uh, never finished high school. She uh, stopped uh, at the 10th grade. Um, but if you all had met her before, prior to her death, you would have thought that she was, you know, a scholar. She was, she was a scholar in my mind, right? And she sent all five of us to college. My dad worked three jobs, but my mother was both, you know, she worked very hard. She worked in the auto industry, and then she'd come home and take care of all five kids. And so for that, I say, I can do, I can do this. So she wakes me up every morning. And then I think of someone like Michelle Obama. And, and I know she's a common force right now, and I love that. Um, but I always think, you know, like right now, her whole message of um, when they go low, we go high. And I think right now, with the way I'm looking at things through November, I'm, I'm, I'm fixated on going high at this point. So those are my two. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I, I just want to, again, on behalf of everyone, Ross, say thank you. You know, thank you for spending time with us today. But most of all, thank you for being you. You're a rarity and in the top ranks of corporate America, and you continue to inspire me, but certainly millions of women across this country. So I just want to say again, thank you for who you are. You're incredible, and we appreciate you, and stay well. And again, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Phyllis, so much. moving right along talk about great information one of the things that stuck out to me amongst many things but one of the quotes that i want to highlight actually comes from ross brewer coo of starbucks she says listen to your inner voice and don't let it get confused with what you're hearing externally this literally brings me right into our second m 
Previously, we talked about our first M, matter. We're gonna move into mind, your mental well-being. A little caveat, mental well-being is different than mental health. They are connected, but different. And we're gonna talk about the preventative care that we can do for our mental well-being when it comes to self-care. And so when we talk about our mental well-being, some identifiers that maybe we are mentally out of shape could be lack of focus. A lot of us losing focus. So before we even move into more identifiers, take a moment, feel your body, come back to that matter. Come back to that mind, let's connect. Awesome, lack of focus, let's get focused right here, or refocus. Another identifier is feel, feeling overwhelmed. I can feel this way sometimes, I must admit, we're all human, feeling overwhelmed, like, you know what, that to-do list, it's never ending. But the reality is, it doesn't end, and that's just life. So let's get comfortable in releasing feeling overwhelmed. Another identifier that I wanna bring up, and this one hits home a little bit more, is stress. I actually get caught up in being confused if I'm stressed. Like sometimes I don't know that I'm stressed. And all of these things are internal dialogue that are just indicators that maybe it's time to protect. It's time to invest in our mental well-being. So here are some suggestions and not the end all be all, but just a few that we can utilize. The first one, brain games. At nighttime before I go to bed, I like to download brain games. Yes, brain games to allow my mind to wander to allow my mind to just decompress a little bit and invest in some time, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes right before bed of doing some brain games. Another thing that comes to mind, puzzles. I love puzzles. Now, I want you to keep in mind that the objective of a puzzle isn't to finish it right away. It's not to get it done. It's to lean into the process, to identify the progress and know that the destination will come, but there's no rush. So allowing, again, that mind to decompress. Another thing that comes up for me is baking. Really helps with anxiety and I'm not the best baker in the world, but often I do it in those times, again, of feeling maybe stressed, confused about being stressed, overwhelmed, or that I can't focus. So lead into that second M, that mind. Check in with yourself and say, you know what? How's my mental well-being today? Again, let's reconnect. Let's get focused. As we move into chapter three, there's more ahead. So let's go ahead and keep it going. My name is Mickey Kendall. I'm a writer, I am an activist, I am a mom, I am a wife, I am every identity that you can include. And I am also one of those kids. I'm one of those black girls that grew up poor on the south side of Chicago. I had government cheese and food stamps and all of those things. I am one of those people. I am also sitting here in front of you today to talk about a book that I wrote. I am the author of Hood Feminism. It's a New York Times bestseller. And you might be thinking, okay, well, how did you get from there to here? And the answer is that I got lucky. I made some good choices. I got some, some opportunities. But more than anything else, I am no different than everyone else that I grew up with, except I had a couple of right turns, a couple of extra chances. And as an adult, I am able to look back and see that I am no different. But I know that the narrative could easily be that I am exceptional, that I could do it anyone could do it, but there are things that anyone doesn't have access to. So let's talk for a minute about money, power, and how that impacts your future. Hood feminism is explicitly about the lived work that women in the inner city are doing to take care of themselves, that women in rural areas are doing to take care of themselves, and that they are doing to take care of their communities. Because fundamentally, their choices for their communities are about Let's make sure everyone has enough to survive. They don't have time to think about whether or not they're going to be a CEO because they're busy trying to make sure that they can keep their schools open, that they can eat themselves, that they can get to the jobs that they have, even if those jobs don't pay enough, that their healthcare needs are tended to. And in many cases, they are in those positions because of the impact of policies like redlining and gentrification. So when we're talking about community funding, community prospects, how people in this community make decisions and why aren't they making better decisions. What we're really talking about is whether or not that community had the money in the first place to determine what was going to happen to it. 
was that community able to access keeping their schools open? Or was it like my community, Chicago, where under one mayor, we lost 50 schools, but collectively over 20 years, we lost more than 200 schools. We lost so many schools that right now, in the time of COVID, we can't socially distance children because there just aren't enough buildings. We're, our kids are going to have to go to school at home, regardless of whether or not their parents can afford for them to be at home while their parents are trying to go to work because there's no way to safely send kids in Chicago back to school. And for a lot of communities, it looks just like that. And then on top of those concerns, we know that hunger is a problem in America. We know that something between five and 10% on average per year of Americans are going hungry. Many of them are children, sometimes as many as 30% in some communities. I grew up going to a school where more than 90% of us were receiving food assistance. The reason we were receiving that assistance is because we were in a neighborhood that had been disinvested. When I was getting out of my situations of leaving a bad marriage, of moving on as a single parent and later going to college, I was able to benefit from public housing that doesn't exist anymore. I was able to get food stamps and a medical card because I'm in a state that didn't make that completely impossible, but I couldn't get cash. So I had to figure out being a single parent, going to college and working part time. And I was able to do those things because I had friends, I had support, I had my community, but I am not exceptional because of who I am, what was exceptional was the amount of help I could rely on. If you never had access to opportunity, you never have access to create opportunity. If you've never been able as a woman working in the world to get your foot in the door in the first place of the good job that pays well, how then are you going to be concerned with your promotion potential, with breaking that glass ceiling? You've got to climb over a concrete wall and bust down a door in the first place in order to get there. And so then you can say, well, those people should vote for better politicians. Well, how are they going to vote? Are their voting rights being limited? Is their access to polls, like polling places, limited? What's happening when they go to vote? What are their choices in front of them? Hood feminism is about making sure you take care of yourself and your community, that everyone has a has what they need to survive, even if they cannot yet thrive. So if your feminism doesn't include looking at those who have less, at those who are marginalized in other ways, then your feminism is failing to meet the standard of being present and supportive of all women. You can have a generational impact, right? Feminism isn't just supposed to be, well, I got mine, now you get yours. It's supposed to be, we have brought equity to the table for all of us. So how will we build that equity? How will we build that access? And the ways that we build it might mean that we don't all get to have every single thing, but you might look around and realize that the world you live in is a better place because everyone in it can afford to eat. They have a safe home. They have access to medical care and they have access to education. The solutions are in front of us to solve our problems it's just that it would mean sometimes being slightly less comfortable and a lot more uncomfortable and sitting with that discomfort long enough to know I can help here or I have done harm here. How can I change the path that we are on? Keeping up with the Joneses isn't what's important. Making sure that you and the Joneses have everything that you need to survive is. Hi, my name is Sara J. Araman. I'm the president of One Fair Wage and the director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. I've been organizing and fighting to raise wages and working conditions in the restaurant industry for the last 20 years. And the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in just utter devastation for workers in the restaurant industry, and in particular, women of color in the restaurant industry over the last many months. This situation faced by about 10 million workers nationwide really dates back 
to a very historical inequity that really comes from slavery. Turns out that tipping in the United States didn't originate in the US, it originated in feudal Europe. When it came to the States, it came right around the time of emancipation. And the restaurant industry wanted the right to hire newly freed slaves, not pay them anything, and have them live entirely on tips, which was a mutation of the original concept of tipping, which was always an extra or a bonus on top of a wage, rather than the wage itself. We went from a $0 wage at emancipation all the way to $2.13 an hour, the current federal minimum wage for tipped workers in the United States. And today, this incredibly low wage doesn't just impact a small sliver of workers. The restaurant industry has become the nation's second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of the U.S. economy with over 13 million workers. One in 10 American workers currently works in restaurants, and one in two Americans, including I'm sure many of you, have worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime. Today, 70% of the workers who earn that ridiculous sub-minimum wage of two or three dollars, depending on the state they're in, are women. They're largely women of color, single mothers, women struggling to survive. So this disparity, seven states that required workers to be paid a full minimum wage and 43 states that allowed workers to be paid as little as two and three dollars resulted in a horrifically disparate experience for millions of workers who lost their jobs with the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdown. About 10 million workers lost their jobs around the country. 60% were told your wages and tips are too low to meet the minimum state threshold to qualify for unemployment benefits. In many cases, women, single mothers, women of color were told, because we gave you a sub-minimum wage of two or three dollars and tips, you cannot qualify for benefits that you paid taxes to receive. Many workers were left destitute and now are being recalled back to work for takeout or delivery, or in some cases, outdoor dining, in some cases, indoor dining, and being told, if you don't come back for that sub-minimum wage of two or three dollars, you will lose any benefits you got. Now, lots of workers are questioning in this moment, should I take that job? Should I take a two or three dollar job exposing myself and my children to the coronavirus for a sub-minimum wage when tips are down across the country, 50 to 75%, depending on the state. These women have been rising up to say, we're just not gonna do it. We're not gonna go back to work for two and three dollars. And fortunately, employers are hearing them. My organization, One Fair Wage, has been approached by literally hundreds of restaurant owners across the country that have said, this is actually the time for change. We've seen finally that actually the system of paying people two and three dollars doesn't work. And so there are three things you can do to help these millions and millions of workers across the country, particularly women and women of color who are struggling with a sub-minimum wage and very little tips. The first is that we've actually created an emergency relief fund for all of the workers who've lost their jobs in the industry. We've raised about $23 million and about 200,000 workers have applied, which is far more than the number of workers we're able to give cash relief to. Second, we've created a program called High Road Kitchens that provides cash grants to amazing, often black and brown owned restaurants around the country that are committing to transition to a full minimum wage with tips on top. Third, you can contact your legislator and say enough is enough, Let's end this legacy of slavery. Let's enact one fair wage now. You as consumers have enormous power both to get legislators to do the right thing and to get employers to transition away from a legacy of slavery and towards a model that will help all of us have a better dining experience. Thank you.
I'm Jennifer Roberts, Chief Executive Officer of Chase Business Banking. I'm delighted to be moderating a panel today with three incredible and inspirational small business owners. First, I'll introduce Blanca Cabrera, owner of Sergio's Family Restaurant in Miami, a staple of the Miami community. Also with us today is Adrian Stewart Gordon co-founder and co-owner of Pound Cake Society, an apparel design, manufacturing, and consulting company. And finally, I wanna introduce Kelsey Bunker, co-founder and owner of the Jupiter Hotel and Jupiter Next in Portland, Oregon. Well, I wanna start by tackling perhaps the most obvious question. How have each of your small businesses survived COVID-19 and what changes did you implement? So Blanca, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, restaurants have obviously been one of the hardest hit industries. So why don't we talk about your experience first? Well, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, um, I've been in business for 30 years, so never prepare me for something like this that came to us suddenly for the past six months. So I think Sergio had a head start because we have delivery and takeout close our window. That is represent 30% of our business. So we were prepared more than probably another restaurants. So we just have to find out if, um, how I'm gonna get the rest of those 70%. And I knew I can hold four, five, six weeks, but longer than that, no. So when uh, they close us down, for maybe a, a week and a half or two, we kind of said, okay, this is like a, a hurricane, Andrew or Katrina, you know, we can keep working for three or four weeks. But um, I realized after the second shutdown that everything was gonna be different. Great, thank you for that. Uh, travel and tourism obviously has been dramatically affected as well and at the forefront. So Kelsey, what did the Jupiter do differently since March? Well, um, within two weeks of the pandemic, the COVID-19 being declared a pandemic, we lost 70% of our income on, on the books. And it became obvious to us that we were going to have an under used if not unused asset. So we began looking around trying to figure out what we might be able, who might need this asset. And at the end of the day, we ended up connecting with our county because they had put a call out for rooms to help the medically vulnerable that were staying in their homeless shelters. And so at the end of the day, that's one of the things that we did to pivot. Thank you for that. Adrian, you also made a switch early in the pandemic, changing from loungewear production to face masks. How difficult was this to, for you to do so quickly? Um, well, thanks for having me, Jennifer. Uh, what we did um, in keeping up with the news cycle and the desperate healthcare need for face masks uh, and PPE, my business partner, Raina Farshuk, had and I had a brief call to figure out how we could help because we're in the apparel manufacturing business and making an accessory, which is basically what a face mask kind of is, uh, wouldn't be tough to do. We used every resource that we had, including disassembling a few things and remaking them with fabric. So we had enough. So all three of your businesses faced uh, obviously these major impacts and are continuing to face impacts, but it didn't hold uh, any of you back from giving back to your communities. How did people react to your donations? It was beautiful. You know, we were wholesalers only and in pivoting, we changed our business model to business to consumer type. It was kind of a business to consumer nonprofit, I don't know, mismatch. And, um, you know, healthcare workers, vet clinics, like I said, everybody was so grateful. You got to hear the stories. Uh, they're worried for their loved ones um, that work in healthcare. And you were a part of a very real struggle to survive. Um, we share those stories with everybody, our contractors, people working with us, all our volunteers, 
and it kept us going. I love that mentality, Adrian. I do think everyone has a role to play and sometimes you can feel like your role isn't as significant as others, but you never know what, what time will tell, right, at, at this point. I think the one thing that the, the three of us here on this panel have in, in common at this moment is this ability to um, think outside the box, the ability to respond to a need the ability to maybe put aside our initial business plan, our initial idea of who we think we are, and um, maybe look beyond ourselves. And I think in this way of looking beyond ourselves and looking to our community, because our communities are what really support us. In order, you're listening to the community and, and the needs of the community, and you decided that it was your time to rise to the occasion. So I, I'm sure all of your customers thank you for that. And Blanca, you pivoted to nationwide online selling of some of your restaurant food. What insights can you share with other business owners about trying out alternate revenue streams other than obviously what you were known for, which was people walking into your awesome restaurants? Well, I can tell you, reinvent yourself. This is something that I have dreamed about three years ago, but none of my staff pay attention to me because we were so busy that I always wanted to, you know, get my croquetas outside Miami, you know, all over. And that's exactly what we did. And believe it or not, the sales have been increased 50% weekly. And on the croquetas is the number one selling item. So hopefully my croquetas will be known one day, like uh, for Americans, like uh, a taco or a, or, a <laughs> chef or something like that. <laughs> So um, no, don't be afraid to try something new. I think at this time, and I can tell that all of us are in the same situation, that our customers and people are more patient. So I wanna close out our panel today by asking each of you, what are you hopeful for in the future? And really, what is that light at the end of the tunnel? For me, the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, professionally is that Everyday Ritual, which is our collection, continues to grow and do well. I just want to keep growing and keep being able to be of service. And, um, you know, in our company, we're trying to be the best versions of ourselves. And we, we encourage our employees and staff to do that as well. And we hope it extends to everything that we do with every garment, every stitch. So that's my hope for the future. I hope people are able to heal and be well and learn this. And we're a better global community as a result of all of this, this experience. Blanca, would you like to add to that? Well, I will tell you this, this too shall pass. And I took this opportunity with COVID-19 and people would say, oh, you are daring to remodel one of my restaurants, the older one that is in a great place and a great parking space. So we increase our outside seating. So it's, it's, I'm really, really looking forward for for seeing our business um, flourish. And Kelsey, we'll end with you. Um, well, I think there's two things that are going on for me. One, for my company, I not have to change those plans 24 hours later. Um, and <laughs> as a community and as a society, I think that the COVID has really exposed a lot of um, things that aren't working for us. And so what I'm really hopeful is that we take this time to maybe address some of those issues and to create a, a, a more fair and just society. And I think that there's a lot of community support for that. So um, I am really hopeful that we come out um, on the other side a better community. I love closing on that optimism from all of you ladies. So thank you so much for agreeing to participate and for sharing your pearls of wisdom. I'm sure all the viewers are really going to love watching you and learning from you. Thank you for having thank, us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoy it. And nice meeting you all. Thank you. This event is on fire. I am feeling all filled up and inspired. One of the things that stuck out to me was something that Adrian Gordon said. She said, I hope that people are able to heal and be well and become a better global community as a result of this experience. And now this leads me into my third and final M, meaning your spiritual well-being. Now before, 
your mind starts to wander, come back, connect, take a note of your physical self, your matter, of course, your mind. And let's talk about the meaning for a second. This sincerely just talks about your soul. They always talk about, you could be eye candy, why not be soul food? Why not be both? Talk about your soul. Here are some identifiers that maybe we're spiritually out of shape. Loss of purpose, feeling like, what am I doing with my life? Questioning life path. What's next for me? Did I make a wrong turn somewhere? Another thing that comes up is uncertain around the progress or the next step in this road called life. All of these are identifiers that maybe we wanna take a moment, we wanna scale back and tap into our spiritual well being. Here are some suggestions, only suggestions. As you can see, plants are behind me, getting back to Mother Earth, really propagating plants, connecting back to Mother Earth. Another suggestion prayer, meditation, breathing. Some say they're different, some say they're all the same. But getting back to moments where you can meditate, you can lean into your breath, you can level set, you can find your center, you can pray. Find something that works for you. This is unique, it's individual, and that's why it's called self-care. So again, that third M is your meaning. Let's go ahead and protect our self-care. As we get into our final segment of Women on the Move 2020, keep in mind three M, your matter. Let's go ahead, shake it off, physically reconnect. Good, our mind, let's get focused. Make some eye contact with me. I see you, girl, all right. And our last M, our meaning, connecting, getting grounded. Come back to your breath. Come back to being centered. And let's move into our final segment. I can't wait. Let's keep it going, y'all. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. I always sing, and I always sing that song because my grandmother taught me that. My grandmother in Alabama, who was born in 1910, that the majority of her life, she wasn't able to vote. But I remember her taking me to vote with her, and she would always take what she called her pocketbook and put it on her arm, and she would put her head up in the air, and we would go vote. I didn't know what we were doing. She never talked to me about voting, but what I knew it was something that we were doing was, was really special and powerful, and it made her feel a sense of pride. My name is Latasha Brown. I am co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund. I am also the visionary founder of the Southern Black Girls and Women's Initiative. And I'm also a fellow at Harvard at the Charles Warren Center and the Women in Public Policy Program. We're on the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act and the Voting Rights Movement. We're on the 100th anniversary of the Women's Suffrage Movement. And so this is a moment for us to reflect on the fact of what women have done before us for us to be at this moment. But a larger question, what is being called of us in this moment? What are we being called to do? We're sitting in the midst of the largest health pandemic in the last hundred years. There are millions of people without employment. There are folks that are literally trying to figure out how they're gonna rebuild their lives. Many of us are working from home. We're also dealing with anxiety. We have sleepless nights. So there's a lot of uncertainty. But what my grandmother often would say, that same woman, she would say, in the midst of pain, that you can create great promise. And so that's when I'm talking about keep your eyes on the prize. That's where I think we have to look. How do we take this moment and literally be able to extract the promise out of it? That we can radically reimagine this nation. That we would collectively think about new systems and ways and innovation that everybody, every citizen of this country could have free and fair access to the ballot and also to have access to health care, quality health care. So two questions. The first question is, what is your radical reimagining of the nation? 
And then two, what part shall you play in bringing that about? And when we sit with that and we think about it, what it makes us really reflect on, I know, you know, do I have the gifts? Absolutely. That we are prepared for such a time as this. If there was ever a time in our history that we needed the voices and the leadership of women, it is now. You know, we know that we've had, just in recent years, we had the largest organizing of women, the largest women's march in the history of this country, of any gathering. What we do know is now, because of the work of women, there are more women represented in Congress than ever. We also know that now we actually have a black woman that is on the ticket to become the vice president of this country. The point being is that a lot of progress is still being made in the midst of pain, but it's being led by women. And we've got to continue to push forward. So there are three things that I want you to remember. One, as Melanie Campbell, who's a mentor of mine, often would say is, we have to recognize the power of the sister vote. So if there was any moment that you need to see yourself and consider yourselves as deputized to not just only vote, but to actually bring others along in this process, it is now. That we're not just voting about one candidate or another candidate or one party or another party. Let's be honest about what this is. This is literally about the future of American democracy. This is literally about are we going to go forward and build a nation that is inclusive, that is equitable, that is literally we're talking about peace and we're talking about literally around racial justice. That's the kind of world that I want to live in. The second thing that I want us to recognize is that our leadership and our voices are needed. So oftentimes we will take a back seat on, we're just gonna work and do what we need to do, but it is the moment for us to assert ourselves. But we should be focusing on where can I make a greater impact so I can change all those things that are around me. I think that that's really important. And the third thing, again, it comes from grandma's wisdom. Let your little light shine. We all have something to contribute, and we need yours now more than ever. So this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let your light shine, sisters. That what we know in this country, that when change happens, women are somewhere in the midst of leading that. And so that's what we need right now. We don't need transactional leadership. We need transformative leadership. We can take this moment that many are experiencing great pain and turn that into promise and the nation that we all deserve and our children deserve. I'm Jen Peepsack, Chief Financial Officer here at J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm joined today by the awe-inspiring, history-making Allison Felix. Allison, thanks so much for being with us today. We really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. You are the most decorated track and field Olympian in history. That deserves repeating. You are the most decorated <laughs> track and field Olympian in history, so congratulations for that. I'm sure your sights were set on continuing that streak at the 2020 Olympics. So what was it like to get the news that the games were postponed until 2021? Thank you. Um, it was definitely extremely disappointing, you know, getting that news. I think everything that was happening in the world at the time, you know, so many people uh, with a loss of life or a loss of jobs or just normalcy really helped put things in perspective. But I had to take time to really grieve that loss and just really be kind to myself in those moments. So tell us a little bit about how adding another year to the Olympic schedule changed your training regimen. You know, at the beginning of the Safer at Home orders, things got really interesting and we had to get extremely creative. I was literally, you know, walking outside of my front door and training on the streets surrounding my house. And I would go to isolated parks and train on soccer fields. And it has been really challenging to be able to find a way to keep that intensity without having the same resources that we had before. 
Tell us about your experience taking on Nike and eventually guaranteeing maternity protections for all of Nike's female athletes. It was really scary. It was terrifying because I wasn't sure, you know, the consequences or what was going to come because of that. And after I did speak out about two months later, um, Nike did change their policy. And it's really not just a Nike issue. You know, it's an industry-wide issue. And so we continue to push for change, but, you know, still, still a ways to go. So true. Your courage is so inspiring. So who inspired you? to take a stand on these kinds of issues? Definitely my parents, and I think it's just the way that they lived their life. My mom was a third grade teacher, and my dad a pastor, and it was just really important for them um, to do things with character and integrity. So I think that really inspired me, um, you know, when I saw something that wasn't right, to be able to, to find a way to speak on it. It's been heartwarming to see the recent photos of your daughter, Cameron, in your home gym with you. My personal favorite was the one I saw where your daughter's wearing a t-shirt that says, run, mama, run. It is just the sweetest, sweetest thing. I just love it. But uh, it, it's also great uh, a great example of the very challenges uh, that mothers have been struggling with during COVID as we've been balancing being a mom and being at work all in the same room oftentimes. How has your experience been managing both being a mom and working during COVID? Yeah, I definitely share those same experiences. My daughter, she just can't understand, like, why can't I get to mom right now? And she she loves to bust through the doors and try to help me through a workout. You know, she loves to make her way onto Zoom calls as well. And I've been just embracing it and trying to ask for help when I can and um, just trying to, to make the most of the situation. It's great advice. In addition to being a top tier athlete, you're also an advocate for mothers everywhere. Did this start with your own experience as a mother-to-be facing career uncertainty because of your pregnancy? It absolutely started with my own experience. You know, the decision to move forward in starting a family was one that I almost felt like I had to accomplish so much before I could even give myself the ability to let my mind go there. And I think it's really unfortunate that women have to have those feelings and to even think about that when um, it's a time that really should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And you've made such an impact. So you also use your platform to raise awareness on the risks and dangers that Black women face during pregnancy and childbirth, an issue that I understand you experience directly. So can you talk a little bit more about this and why it's so important to you and how other women can help? Yeah, I went into my doctor's appointment, a regular checkup at 32 weeks, and I was diagnosed with a severe case of preeclampsia. I felt like before I had kind of known the statistics around um, Black women and women of color, we are three to four times more likely to face um, complications or even death while giving birth. Being a professional athlete, I'm healthy, I, I know what to eat, I train throughout my pregnancy. To find myself really thrust in the middle of this emergency, I just felt like I wasn't prepared. And so I just know what a difficult time it was. And so to be able to just help others, you know, through that and share stories, I think um, is really just what my heart is called to do. Your passion also extends to inspiring and promoting the next generation of women in sports. And we see that girls' participation in sports is decreasing, especially it seems around the middle school age. So why do you think that is and what can we do to change it? That's the age where there's a real social stigma around girls participating in sports. You have bullying starting. Also, just these other factors of the access to sport, you know, costs, um, transportation. So I think it's really by giving girls positive role models to look to, breaking down some of these barriers for their participation um, are always ways that we can continue to uplift them and encourage them to stay engaged and involved in sports. And we know through research and just our own experience how important and life-changing being involved in sports can be. Yeah, there are so many just life lessons that give you a foundation no matter what you go into. Time management and work ethic, um, dealing with defeat, you know, picking up the pieces and how do you move on from that. It doesn't matter if you go on to be a professional athlete or a field altogether different. You constantly go back to those lessons that you learned. So I am always um, just an advocate for 
you know, kids being involved in sport because I know that it has the ability to really change their lives. Uh, on advice, what advice would you give on maintaining focus on a goal in the midst of a crisis as we've all had to do? Having hope and still pushing forward through this time has really helped me. I want to come out on the other side of this crisis feeling stronger and feeling better and having used my time to the best of my ability. What small things can I work on today, um, you know, to be able to, to come out feeling better and stronger? Well, I'm certainly looking forward to, and I know many, many others are too, watching you in the Olympics next year. But when you think about your legacy, what do you want to be remembered for? It's interesting. I think, um, you know, had I been asked that question years ago, it would have looked something like records and, um, you know, gold medals on the track. But uh, the journey has really changed me and shifted my focus. And I would love to be remembered for work that I've done for women. Being a mom now and having a, a young daughter, I think a lot about what the world will look like as she grows up. I hope that, you know, I can be remembered for work in that area and, and just simply to make the, the world a better place for my daughter and all the, um, all the kids in her generation. You're amazing. Thanks again, Allison, for being with us. Know that you will always have a huge fan base at J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, we really, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your wisdom with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to chat with you guys. Hello, everyone. I'm Tashonda Brown Duckett, CEO of Chase Consumer Banking. I have the absolute distinct honor to be speaking today with an impact maker, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Dr. Rice served as the 66th Secretary of State from 2005 to 2009. She is the second woman and the first black woman to hold this post. She is a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the director of the Hoover Institution. And yes, She's a sports enthusiast. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Rice. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's jump in. I would love for you to share the role that your parents played in raising you to see possibilities for yourself and your career. Well, thanks very much. And thanks for starting with my parents, because in order to know me, you had to know John and Angelina Rice. Even growing up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama, where you couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant, uh, they had me believing I could be president of the United States if I wanted to be. And um, I remember they really had a couple of ways of, of telling you what was expected of you. One was, you have to be twice as good. Now, they didn't say that as a matter of debate. They said that as a matter of fact. And we went mm -hmm. around trying to be twice as good. That means you're twice as confident. And so I think that was a really foundational uh, idea. Uh, the second was there are no victims. You may not be able to control your res your circumstances, but you can control your response to your circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so it was faith and family and education, high expectations, lots of love. And I give them all the credit for who I became. Wow. I mean, you just dropped three gems in like one minute. And I especially loved the twice as confident, not once, but twice as confident is such a powerful statement uh, to make, especially to so many women that are listening um, today. So when you think about the impact that your parents made, all the things that they instilled in you, as well as the community, how did that translate to sparking your interest in political science? Well, uh, to be frank, it, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> they wanted me to be, and I wanted to be a concert pianist. Right. I studied piano from the age of three. I was going to be the greatest concert pianist. At the end of my sophomore year in college, I went to the Aspen Music Festival School, and I met all these 12-year-olds who could play from sight what it had taken me all year to learn. I was 17. I thought, got to have a plan B. And finally, in my junior year, and, and it's now spring quarter, I walked into a course in international politics. It was taught by a man named Joseph Corbell, uh, who, by the way, inspired another very successful woman who was the first, his daughter, Madeleine Albright. 
the first woman yes. to be Secretary of State. And he just inspired me to do it. But I think probably the connection is that uh, my parents really taught me that I could do just about anything that I wanted to do. Don't let people deny you that passion because of who you are, mm. what you look like, or where you came from. And um, so for me, uh, that was the lesson of doing something that was a little bit out of the ordinary for my color and my gender. You were a trailblazer. What was your experience of being the first on so many different levels and different moments throughout your career? Well, let's remember that people who turn out to be the first generally didn't set out to be the first. They just did something and then they were the first. But I think when you're the first, um, you yeah, there's a little voice that says, well, don't let the first be a failure. So maybe there is a little extra pressure. But mostly, I think you're a person, if you've gotten to that place, who probably has had very high expectations of yourself. And so the biggest pressures come from just that. The other thing about being a first is that you recognize uh, that you won't see others like you and that you may have to be the first so that others can be the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And in that sense, it's really um, something to celebrate. Well, you definitely represent the art of possibility for so many. That wasn't why you did it, but you absolutely did it, which I think is just so, so important for so many of us to see. So what advice would you give to everyone watching on what they need to earn the right to have not just a mentor, but someone that would advocate for you? Well, I'm so glad that you put it that way because um, mentorship is earned. Mentorship has to be organic and it grows out of getting to know somebody in a relationship. So here's the advice. If you're looking for a mentor and you see somebody that you really admire and you think, oh, I like the way they go about what they do, uh, don't walk up and say, will you be my mentor? Say, can we have a cup of coffee? Can I talk to you about something that I read that uh, tells me that you might have ways of helping me to figure out who I'm, uh, where I'm going and how to get there. That is the way to start building relationship, which ultimately can become a, mentor a mentorship. I want to shift to social justice. You grew up in the segregated South. You have been a trailblazer. You lived through the civil rights movement and protest, and you're still living through it with Black Lives Matter. How do you see the interconnectivity between Black Lives Matter and the civil rights movement and the issues that were being fought in the 60s that in some respect are still being fought today? Well, some of the issues are still being fought in the kind of broad sense of uh, still trying to get over what was our birth defect, which was slavery uh, as Americans, and the fact that uh, it still marks the way that we see each other, the way that we treat each other, the expectations perhaps for good or bad that we have of each other. But we also have to realize we've come a long way since the 60s. I have said on a number of occasions, a black man being killed by the police wouldn't have even been a footnote in the Birmingham newspaper. And so the fact that there are people who now will go into the streets and march of different colors, different generations, different economic backgrounds to protest that, yes, we've come a long way. The fact is we have had a black president. We've had black secretaries of state. We've had black attorneys generals. Uh, in Birmingham, my parents had to boycott because they wouldn't hire black clerks in the stores. So let's not dishonor the achievements and the work of the people who got us to where we are by saying nothing's changed. Let's say instead, what's the next chapter, to use your word, in where we go? Because the fact is, you, we're not going to be colorblind. That, that's, that's too hard. I just want us to act as if we're colorblind. And if we can get there, we're going to be a much more just society. But I will tell you another thing. While it is, if you're black, uh, their life is different. I don't care where you are in your station of life. But if you're black and living in poverty, or black and living without an education, that's a whole different set of circumstances. And so I've been saying to my friends, particularly my white friends, I, I actually don't want your guilt. I want to know what is your commitment to dealing with what we know are impacts of race. We know that it matters 
where you live as to whether you're going to get into a good school or not. And so let's work on that. I understand that there are that there are problems of race built into the system, so so-called systemic racism. But I also need to break it down to a point that I can actually work on it. And so for me, it's always been about education and high quality education for every kid. I love that. And I think we all say, I don't want anyone to be colorblind because it's beautiful, you know, to see the world with all of its beauty. We just don't want to be judged and discriminated as a result. So thank you for that. I would love for you to give a word of encouragement to so many Black women who are exhausted, who are tired, and also encouragement to all the allies that are required for us to truly bend towards a perfect union in good trouble. I know that um, it's hard and I know that people get tired. And look, we're going through a period of time right now where it's really hard. And you've had the pandemic, uh, social unrest, the economic circumstances coming out of the pandemic. If you're in California, you're dealing with wildfires and smoke, and it it just, sometimes it just might seem overwhelming. But I would say to all of us, should we really think we have the right to get tired? When I think of what my grandparents went through and the daily humiliations of just living as a black person in Birmingham, Alabama, and yet they managed somehow to educate all their kids, and my grandfather on my father's side even managed to get an education himself. And so I would say we don't have the right, the time, or in fact, we don't have the possibility of being tired. This is democracy and democracy is hard. It's not easy. What's hard is you have to take personal responsibility for your, your fellow citizens. You have to take personal responsibility for helping to change the institutions. You have to take personal responsibility for saying, I'm not going to sleep until every child has a chance at a high quality education. And the optimism comes from knowing that progress can be made. And so I've been saying people choose one thing that you care about and work on it. You are one of the shoulders of giants that we all stand on, all different backgrounds, men and women. You do represent the ideals of a more perfect union and staying in that good trouble in the words of the late John Lewis. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of everyone around the globe at J.P. Morgan Chase. Thank you for being that impact maker. Thank you for demonstrating what the art of possibility is and the power of allyship and forward progress. Thank you so much, Dr. Rice. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. Hello, everybody. I'm Mary Erdos, and wow, what a day it's been. What a year it's been. COVID-19 has been challenging for us in so many ways. We've all had to learn new ways of working, literally overnight, while keeping our employees safe and meeting the challenging needs of our clients. We've had to be both teacher and parent. We've had to prioritize the health and well-being of others and lean on our communities for support. We know all these demands have been especially hard on women, and that's why we dedicate this entire day to you. I hope hearing from the diverse speakers about the challenges that they've faced in the pandemic give you comfort you aren't alone in the stresses and the anxieties that you're facing. So now I have the distinct honor of introducing the final session led by my close friend, Mindy Grossman. Mindy Grossman took over Weight Watchers and transformed it into WW. She's made it a wellness company accessible to all. Mindy and WW worked tirelessly to help underserved communities thrive and to build healthy habits. And joining Mindy is her very special board member and the global media leader who needs absolutely no introduction, our very special guest, Oprah Winfrey. I hope all of you will join me in this great grand finale in welcoming Mindy and Oprah.
thank you, Mary, for that warm and, and wonderful introduction. And I'm particularly excited to have my partner and friend, Oprah, join us today for an important conversation about healthy living, leadership, uh, and things beyond that. So great to be here with you, Oprah. And I thought maybe we could go back to the start of the year, it seems like forever now, um, where you embarked on a nationwide WW Presents Oprah's 2020 Vision Tour. And as part of that, you asked all the audience members if they were ready to activate their, activate their visions. So what does activating a vision look like? Activating a vision is about knowing the most important that is significant for all of us. And the question is, what do I want? And activating what do I want in the form of being able to articulate your intention for executing the dream or the vision uh, 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 for, for that answer. So activating it means saying, I, I'm going to articulate for myself, what is it I really want? And then lay out a way of seeing, meaning vision, seeing how to get there. One of the things that you've said, now more than ever, it's important to be and stay well. Oh yeah. I feel that in my own personal life as one who's not, not left the grounds here in uh, Santa Barbara, except for an eye infection. And, and then I wore two masks, gloves, boots, the whole thing. Um, what this pandemic, what, what uh, these life experiences have shown all of us is the value uh, and importance of what it means to be healthy and to stay well. And that is not just you know in your physical body, of course, but also in your mental and spiritual well-being. And so I spend a lot of energy, not only thinking about that, but working towards wellness for myself. And what I encourage is, you know, our, our members and anyone who's listening to us now or watching us now, is that it starts with your own, putting yourself on the list of what is the priority in your life. And you have to make yourself the priority so that you can not only create wellness for yourself, but so that the well-being moves throughout your work and family. Women who are managing so many things that they're completely overwhelmed right now, you have to give yourself the opportunity and the priority to, to be number one on your list. And I remember years ago when we did an Oprah show about this and Cheryl Richardson was the life coach and she was telling women, this is in the 90s, that you need to put yourself first on the list. Women started booing her on the show. And I was <laughs> and and saying, hey, 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 we're not Jerry Springer here. This is not the Jerry Springer show. We don't boo people. Because the very idea of making yourself a priority is still a foreign concept and to a lot of women because they think it's selfish. Well, it isn't selfish. It is, it, it's actually self-fulfilling in that if you take care of yourself first, getting up a half an hour earlier, making sure you shut off your phones and get yourself the proper sleep that you need, get yourself the proper water that you need, get yourself the nourishment physically, emotionally, spiritually that you need so that you can be the strong one for the rest of your family and your, your work in your community. It's essential. It's just I know it's so critical right now, especially now when you see what a lot of people are going through with what's happening at schools and everything else. Um, you know that that time I, for me. You and I have I have girls who who a couple a couple of them are living with me now who have graduated college and were part of my school in uh, South Africa and they're staying here during COVID because they were in, in Los Angeles and so. You have a grown daughter and also now grandchildren. Yeah. I have them all living here. It's like a compound. Right. So are we, like a compound. So, but here's the thing being able to manage my own health and well being, my own health and well being has been so significant in my being able to manage the rest of the family unit here. 
And so I start with in the morning, some form of silence, stillness. Uh, you can call it meditation or not. Some days it is a full on 20 minute thing, but literally it's just, it, it, even if it's just in the shower, taking a moment to close my eyes and sort of be with myself and focus on what I want the day to look like. And the, not more, more importantly, what kind of person I want to be in this day with so much going on. What kind of person, what kind of, re, how do I want to respond to all of the things that are going to be coming at me during this day? I think self-reflection and self um, um, spirituality, being able to give that to yourself is what is enabling so many other women to keep going. And I, you can, I, listen, I have nothing but compassion and empathy for the people who are managing children, noise, working at home, all having to cook a meal every day. I mean, I have help and only have to do it two days a week. And I'm like, whoa, I've, I've run out of ideas and recipes, you know? One of the other things is, um you know, what this pandemic has brought into our lives to, as what you were saying is a complete reset, which I think goes along with a complete reappraisal of really what's important. Um, you know, what's your perspective on how that's going to change things? I think it only changes things if people are willing to, to do the real work of looking inward. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, oh wow, this is wonderful and that it's going to give everybody a time out to be with themselves, to figure out what is really the most important, what is most meaningful, what matters in your life. You get a reset to go forward. And now I think people are just weary. They're weary of being restricted. They're weary of being told that this is going to go on longer than anybody imagined. They're weary of being told that you're not going to have a vaccine until the middle or late 2021 and some people are sort of giving up in their spirits but i always see that the quote from eckhart tolle's a new earth which is one of my favorite uh and most powerful and productive spiritual teachings where he says life will give you the experience you need for the evolution of your consciousness and how do you know it's the experience you need because it's the experience you are having in any given moment. So whatever experience you are having, that is the experience you need as an individual and as a collective. We obviously needed this time out to reset and reassess who we are as a people, as a nation, as an international global body, and how we want to treat ourselves and how we want to treat each other. I don't think that we come out on the other side of it uh, better than we went in unless people give serious thought to those questions. And so this requires our evolving into a new way of being, just as we're doing now, a new way of communicating, a new way of adjusting. And I think uh, the, the, the five stages of grief defined by Elizabeth Kugler-Ross not only are appropriate when it comes to uh, losing someone that you love in your life, they're appropriate for all things. And because we are not just grieving the loss of loved ones, those who have unfortunately lost people who they, 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 they know and love, we are grieving the loss of a way of living. We're grieving the loss of summer. We're gr grieving the loss of being able to communicate with our, 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 our colleagues, being able to have graduation, go have weddings. Do we're we're create we're really grieving a loss of the way we were, and the only way to get to the point where you can be okay with this moment now is that you go through that morning. First, it's shock, then it's denial, as a lot of people are still in right now, and it's also anger, as a lot of people are in right now. But eventually getting to the point where you can accept this is the way it is now and what can each of us do now to move ourselves forward which is the number one principle of suffering you know until you can accept things for what they are 
and then make a choice about how do I now move forward with the way things are, you will suffer. Now, I cannot agree with you more. I know at WW, for example, we've accelerated, expanded our wellness ecosystem to give people as much support as they can, whether that's mindset content, fitness, um, the launch of sleep, um, sleep rituals, personal nutrition, as well, very importantly, our social platform, which people are craving now more than ever. They want to be inspired. They want to inspire others. Um, but the reality is we can only be there for others if we take care of ourselves. And I think it's just so important right now. So Mindy, you're a leader known for your gut instinct and for the, the, the ability to lead companies through major transformations, which is what you've been doing for us at WW. I want to know what is it that makes you you feel um, confident making huge decisions, particularly in today's world and marketplace? Yeah, I think I've always said risk-taking and boldness are the essence of transformation. And particularly in today's environment, not taking the risk is actually riskier when you have to move quickly, you have to be agile. But I always say you also have to remember that there's a difference between risk and suicide, right? You really have to do the work in the underpinnings before you make those decisions. You have to have the right culture, the team, the alignment on strategy, but really focus on what's right for the brand and the consumer. And I think that's really you know, what we've done to be able to move so quickly through this time. And, you know, I, the other thing that I say, particularly, you know, in crisis mode, you know, and I say I took the company public in August 2008. I thought that was going to be my last crisis and, you know, now coming into this. Um, but I'm not just the CEO. I'm the chief communications officer. I'm the chief crisis officer. And frankly, I'm the chief hope officer really keeping everyone aligned around how we are going to come out of this in a stronger position with people who are going to need us more than ever. And that has to become something very galvanizing. And if we're not going to take the risk now, we're not going to be able to really maximize everything that we can accomplish. Well, I would conclude that by saying anybody who's watching, you need to risk everything to be well because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to ma matter because you can't do anything. You, uh, you know, we know all of the adages, you know, putting, giving yourself the oxygen mask, filling your own tank first, but you can't do anything unless you yourself are whole and well, and you want all of your work, which is what I aspire to in my own life, is that all of my work comes from a place of wholeness so that everything that you have to offer anybody comes from a place of wholeness you are so full your cup runneth over and you have all of this wholeness and fullness and fulfillment to offer to other people so uh, um, I, i'm just happy to be a part of a company that holds the mission of um, making people feel whole and completing that circle for themselves that circle of wellness and well-being for themselves so that they can give back to not only themselves and their own personal lives, but to their families, their community, and our world. And I know how that might, that really inspires everyone every single day because you can't do it if you're not your whole self. And yeah. you're such an example of that. And certainly, you know, everyone we touched on the tour and everyone we touched in the virtual world and everyone we're looking to touch now, that is such a strong message, um, particularly in today's environment. So. I can't thank you enough for sitting down with me. I love our conversations. And uh, thanks to everyone at J.P. Morgan Chase for hosting us both. Um, we really enjoyed being here. Thank yeah. you. Too. Yeah. Striving for wholeness, not perfection. Wholeness. OMG. Oprah, in all her Oprahness, I, I literally can't fill my hands. This was 
Amazing. Uh, before we go, I wanted to give some call to actions. We had our three M's, our matter, our mind, our meaning. Your call to action is to take five minutes, at least five minutes a day, in prioritizing your self-care and investing in each of those three things. Also, I mentioned Power Her in the very beginning. It is time, now more than ever, that we lift each other up. And so what I'd like you to do is to take to social media, spotlight a woman who has impacted your life, share a photo of her, and of course, share with us how she's made the difference to you. Use the hashtag power her and tag and nominate her to do the same. Let's keep this conversation going. Also, we want to make change. We heard, we listened, we leaned in. Now it's time to do. Make sure you vote. Make sure we use our female ambition and energy and vote. That was an incredible event. Grateful to be a part of it. A really big thank you to JP Morgan Chase, to all of our incredible speakers, to you today for spending time with us. That was, of course, incredible because guess what? You were involved when Women on the Move, Leadership Day 2020. I cannot wait to connect with you next time. I am Allie Love. Have a good one, everyone. Peace and love.